Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Understanding the DOL's Proposed Update to Overtime Regulations. As you all know, on August 30th, the DOL announced their proposal to substantially increase the minimum salary level needed to qualify an employee as exempt. Now, I'm sure many of you immediately started thinking back to 2016. Wait a minute. I'm sure all of you went back and started thinking of 2016. I did. That's when the Obama administration had proposed another significant salary increase, as well as a uh, short deadline to get these evaluations done. Well, exempt, non-exempt classification was top mind for many organizations, and there was a sense of urgency in the air. Now, there are some similarities between these proposals, but what we've learned through past experiences is that these have helped employers refocus their priorities to audit, review, and to update to be best prepared for potential changes. I mean, let's face it, there's no crystal ball to know what's next, but proactively understanding the changes is the best way to prepare. I'm Michael Wirth, I'm the Vice President of Sales at Compliance HR, and I would like to thank all of you for joining us today. We know how busy your days are, and we appreciate that you take an hour to spend with us today. But this is a very important topic, and I, I really am excited to talk about it because within the six days um, that this webinar announcement was out there, we had over 4,000 people sign up to attend. And so far, 2, 000, over 2,000 people have attended today. So the good news is my friends, Libby Henninger and David Jordan are Littler shareholders and chairs of the Wage and Hour Practice Group at Littler. And these two experts will provide you a brief DOL history, a review of the current proposed regulations, and provide insight on how to prepare for what's ahead. Now look, you all know Littler Mendelssohn, the world's largest employment law firm with over 1,800 attorneys and 100 offices around the world. But I am so proud to tell you that there are many, many compliance HR clients attending to this webinar today. So thank you for being our clients. Thank you for attending today. And for many of you, we've been down this road before, so we know exactly what's ahead of, the, ahead of us today. Those of you who are not familiar with compliance HR, we are a unique combination of a technology platform, Yoda Logic, and Littler. There's no Googling or guessing. Users quickly receive accurate, up-to-date information regarding employment rules. Our goal is to simplify the complexity of employment law. And we do this by offering a suite of technology solutions around critical HR compliance topics, whether it's handbooks, lead, independent contractor classification. We provide self-service expert advice in a fraction of the time of traditional methods. Now, we're going to focus today on Navigator OT, and don't tell everyone back at my company, but Navigator OT is my favorite solution, and it's simply because it's loaded with all the federal and state tests. Littler looked at thousands of cases and opinion letters, and that logic's been built into our reasoning engine. And what I love about it is you put your fact pattern in, and it's kind of things like a person based on this jurisdiction and this fact pattern, here's the level of risk. So. Um, for those of you um, who are our clients, you'll be interested to know that we ran over 8,000 evaluations in the last six months of 2016, and I'm happy to share successful audit methodologies we used in the past. We'll discuss this later, but if you're interested, you can sign up for this survey, hit yes now, and we'll sign you up for a brief demonstration and a free trial. We'll talk about your organization's requirements, We'll share with you Navigator Suite functionality, and we'll give you a, a, a trial to get you started. Now, for Compliance HR clients, stay tuned. Our new Navigator Overtime 2.0 will be released in Q4, and this is loaded with enhancements. Functionality, usability, if you thought our system was easy to use before, wait till you get your hands on these. Now, you can also request a free um, trial at any time by clicking on this link where the red button is. You can also put any of the questions that are meaningful to you in here so that we can try to respond to them at the end. If we don't get to them all, we'll try to put together a summary of the top questions that came through here. And as usual, we will record today's presentation and everything will be sent out later on um, as a follow-up. Now, I have the pleasure of introducing you to today's presenter, David Jordan, 
and Libby Henninger. David? Thanks, Michael. Really appreciate it, and thank you for hosting this really important webinar. I'm excited that at least uh, 2,400 of you right now have taken some time today to come listen to us talk about the obscure topic of overtime exemptions. And I told my kids this morning I was talking about overtime exemptions and invited them to join along. They quickly said no. Uh, but but as for all of you, I think uh, the vast attendance that Michael mentioned and, and mentioned that we've had in the past, as well as today, I think indicate uh, that as these changes from the Department of Labor get trickier uh, and maybe more unreasonable, uh, the more people attend. Um, one, because it's hard, um, it's difficult to understand, it's difficult to rationalize, and for probably all 2,500 of you on the phone now, um, you have to explain this to your internal business partners, to your employees, uh, and to maybe lawyers on the other side that are convinced that you're doing it wrong. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Michael and Compliance HR for uh, their business partnership. Uh, they offer super solutions um, to help companies navigate these issues, solutions that, frankly, Libby and I have been involved in since uh, Compliance HR was birthed. So uh, I appreciate Michael there. And, and as Michael mentioned, uh, uh, Libby and I are, are partners here at Littler Mendelssohn, and we are uh, uniquely involved in wage and hour issues at the firm nearly all day long, every day for most of our careers. I am a uh, wage and hour lawyer in Houston, Texas, and I practice wage and hour law, uh, both litigation and advice coast to coast, really from Alaska to Puerto Rico. And, and Libby is really our firm's wage and hour savant and uh, one of our well-connected <laughs> well-connected DC partners who really has probably one of the most unique understandings of the politics behind some of these issues um, as anybody in the country. Uh, Libby's probably also the only person that read all 89 small print pages of the notice of proposed rulemaking that was found deep in the federal register. Um, and, uh, probably the only person that uh, loved every minute of it while she did it. Um, I don't know about you love, David, but yes. <laughs> for, for me, uh, I learned to fast forward to the last two and a quarter pages of those 89 pages where the actual proposed regulations are. Libby, however, though, um, as you can imagine, is the one that's really concerned about how we get there. And you'll hear her talk more about that today. But let me talk a little bit about um, uh, a little bit of how we got here, and I'll set it up for uh, Libby. I, you know, I tell my teenage girls who I mentioned a minute ago that um, yes, they have to uh, uh, learn their history, they have to understand their history because it really does help us understand where we are today. And so, for all of you, a short history lesson. Let's start with the Fair Labor Standards Act and. Let me give you guys a little bit of history. Um, not everyone, I think, uh, is interested in the history behind the Fair Labor Standards Act. It was actually signed by FDR during the, at sort of the end of the Great Depression in 1938. It was actually, there was a proposed version of the Fair Labor Standards Act in 1932. So in the middle of the Great Depression, Unemployment at the time was 25%. That means one out of four Americans was unemployed. And when Senator Hugo Black, that's future Supreme Court Justice, Senator Hugo Black, proposed the FLSA then, the 40-hour work week was not the proposal. It was a 30-hour work week. It's an interesting touch point I thought you guys would find very interesting. By the time that FDR proposed the Fair Labor Standard Act in 1938, um, unemployment had only dropped to 20%. So one out of five Americans remained 
unemployed. It was the cornerstone of FDR's New Deal program. And the goal, the goal of, of, of the Fair Labor Standards Act was to put more workers to work and to bring down that unemployment rate. And how do you do that? You penalize companies for working employees more than 40 hours. And that's what that's why we have an overtime rate. So uh, what was the statute? Well, the statute uh, essentially said, right, you have to pay overtime when an employee works more than 40 hours. And what is an overtime rate? It's one and a half times the regular rate. And we could have entire presentations on what that uh, regular rate means and how to do that math. The Fair Labor Standards Act also contained a minimum wage obligation. Um, and that's a little bit relevant here today because the, the EAP exemptions today we're gonna talk about today cover both minimum wage and overtime. And you'll see on the slide, we talk about six categories uh, that are exempted from the minimum wage and overtime requirements of the Fair Labor Standards Act. That's the executive exemption, the administrative, the learned professional, the creative professional, the computer and the outside sales. Um, but what this, the statute did not tell us is what any of that means. And you'll see at the second bullet point um, that the terms, uh, the Department of Labor has given the authority to define and delimit those words by regulation. By the way, delimit, my Oklahoma education did not teach me what that word meant. Uh, I have looked it up in the past. Uh, for those of you interested with uh, similar educations, delimit means mark the boundaries of. So Congress said, hey, Secretary of Labor, it's your job to tell us what is the executive, the administrative, the learned professional, et cetera, exemptions mean. So from there, I think I've set it up right for you, Libby, to take us off. What, what happens with the regulatory scheme? Absolutely. Thank you for the history lesson, David. Um, and it, I think it's it's interesting to, to kind of figure out why we're so focused on this one aspect of the of, of salary. Like, why are we even talking about salary when we talk about the Fair Labor Standards Act? And so I think it's important, as David mentioned, um, what we're regulating is the exemptions that apply to your white collar workers, your white collar employees, often known as the EAP exemptions, the executive, administrative, and professional exemptions, kind of the short term that you'll see put into a lot of the regulations or if you did dive into that very esoteric uh, regulatory language as I did, or just look at the two and a half page summary at the at the end as David did. Um, you know, they'll often shorthand it as the EAP exemption. So I mean, we just wanted to baseline what we're even talking about, and really what you're looking at what's required to be an exempt employee are three things. You know, one is that salary level, and that's what we're focused on primarily here today. That's what's being proposed to be raised. Um, the salary basis requirement, which basically means you have to pay that set fixed salary, and it can't be, you can't take improper deductions to that. It has to be set and fixed no matter how many hours you work. So an exempt employee is paid that set and fixed amount, no matter if they work 25 hours in a week or if they work 50 hours in a week. Um, that's that concept there. And then, of course, the duties test, in addition to the salary level, in addition to meeting the minimum salary requirements, employees also have to meet the very specific duties requirements. And each of those duties requirements are different depending on which exemptions you're looking at. And as David mentioned, that could be a webinar of, its, of itself, one of which I've, I've given through CHR and, um, and elsewhere and, um, and can last at least an hour just, just, just on that. Um, but in terms of um, what we're looking at today, we were thinking perhaps that 
the Department of Labor might take a look at modifying duties, might take this as an opportunity to modify those duties tests. There's been a lot of call for certain areas of modification, particularly in the sales profession, um, but we just didn't see any proposed changes there. So really where, how we've gotten here to the salary level and kind of what is being proposed right now, um, since the initiation of the Fair Labor Standards Act in 1938, actually the initial initiation in 1938 did not contain a salary level. There was no salary initially, but starting in 1940 and then going to 1975, um, the Department of Labor raised the salary level for exemptions approximately every five to 10 years. And there were different salaries that were attached to meet the requirements as well as uh, the different duties tests. Um, and they would just depend on which exemption oftentimes you were you were looking at. So uh, what the Department of Labor had done for the most part during this time period, and there's a lot of variation, but they would set different salaries for executive and administrative exemptions and perhaps a higher salary for professional exemptions, thinking that if you're really a professional, you'd have to earn a little bit more. Um, and that there was even a higher salary set for um, for all other exemptions, and that's kind of where we looked at that long test, short test. So if you earned more in salary, you might not have to meet all of the requirements. But if you earned a little bit lower in a salary, there were more duties requirements that you would have to make. Now in 2004 was the biggest overhaul to all of the regulations, both the duties requirements as well as the salary tests that we have seen since the inception, probably, of the Fair Labor Standards Act. And one of the things that they did was they just eliminated that distinction. They eliminated the difference between that long and short test, between the differences in compensation levels and duties requirements that you might need to make um, when you were looking at the correlation between salary and duties. And then instead, they adopted that one set standard minimum salary of $455 a week or a little bit less than $24,000 a year. They also did adopt at that time, I think, in recognition that at a certain level, the salary could substitute for some duties. Um, that certain people that are earning a certain amount that is sufficiently high enough, you could relax the duties. So in recognition of that, they did adopt what is called the highly compensated employee exemption. And at the time in, in 2004, it was set at $100,000. And the idea was you'd still have to meet one of the exemptions, but some of the duties were relaxed kind of with that $100,000 threshold substituting in as uh, one of the requirements. Now, that amount, that 455 survived and was in place for over 20 years. So we, we lived with uh, that 455 for many years. Now, now as all, many of you guys know, um, there were several states, California being one, New York being another, that set salaries that were above that 455 threshold. They still you know, have salaries above that 455 threshold. Um, but most states maintain that 455 threshold up through and until 2015, where we got a new proposed notice of rulemaking, where for the first time, since that 2004 overhaul, the Department of Labor decided to take a look at the current salary threshold and significantly increase them. And in doing so, they benchmarked the, um, 
the increases to increase to the 40 percentile of the lowest wage region of the census, which at the time it still is, is the South. And in getting there, at the time the final rule was issued in 2016, they got to $48,000 with that benchmark, or 913 a week. They also um, looked at increasing the highly compensated employee exemption at the same time using kind of similar metrics, but this, this time they benchmarked it at a 90th percentile of all salaried workers and they, they used data, a data point that was nationwide. And in doing so, they increased the highly compensated employee exemption threshold to $134,000 and $4, right? Can't forget the $4. Um, and at the time, they did not make any revisions to the duties test, which we thought they might, but it was solely based on compensation. They did propose in the in the final in the initial proposed rulemaking, they proposed to automatically increase the salary every year. The final rule set it at automatic increases every three years. And then it also allowed employers to use certain guaranteed Com guaranteed compensation, which includes bonuses and commissions that are paid at least quarterly or less frequently to count towards 10% of those minimum salary levels. So this is what we uh, were told was, were going to be the changes in 2016. And as many of you all remember, uh, you started preparing to implement those changes. And you looked at all of your current exempt employees, and you decided, what are we going to do with these employees? Are we going to increase salaries? Are we going to reclassify employees? Are we going to do um, a combination of both? Are we going to look at alternative compensation plans? Are we going to, um, you know, see if we need employees? Maybe if someone leaves, do we have to... Uh, continue to employ someone, or can we kind of assume the, that salary um, and and spread it over other employees? I mean, there were a lot of different considerations that took place in preparation for getting ready for the final rule that was issued in in 2016. It was it was a big increase because it more than doubled the current salary level. And then, David, what happened? Um, many of you all remember, but in case you forgot, um, what happened in that twenty to that twenty sixteen final rule? Well, you know, I remember driving home to Grandma's house on the day before Thanksgiving in late November of twenty sixteen, and getting word on my phone that Littler had obtained an injunction, a nationwide injunction, stopping the 2016 ruling from going into effect just 10 days later on December 1. And uh, I imagine probably like every other payroll and HR and labor and employment attorney um, in the country, I just spent my year working on this and now it's gone away. And I'm sure many of the 2,700 people on this call uh, remember that weekend vividly. It was a time where people were putting together the last minute rush uh, to reclassify. Letters were going out to employees. Letters had gone out to employees. Payroll had already been changed and everything screeched to a halt. And, and why did that happen? Well, there were 22 states and 55 business organizations that filed a lawsuit in the Northern District of Texas, um, in Sherman, Texas, uh, seeking a, a, a preliminary and permanent injunction to the rule going into effect. There were a number of arguments that were made. 
Um, but the court preliminarily enjoined the rule on that day before Thanksgiving. And they did so, noting that the salary level was so high that it disregarded the congressional unambiguous intent to exempt workers because of their executive, administrative, and professional duties. Because what was going to happen was that 4.2 million Americans who otherwise are doing executive, administrative, and professional work were no longer going to be exempt from minimum wage and overtime, not because of their duties, but because of what the states and the trade organizations argued was an arbitrary increase in the number. And that the Department of Labor did not have the power to disregard Congress's intent. And that is, if you go back to the slide I said earlier, where I talked about the beginning of the FLSA, Congress said these people in these particular positions are exempt. And if a salary level carves out 4 million people from those groups, it's unambiguous. And so uh, that's exactly what Judge uh, Mazant did. He enjoined that rule. A couple of really other interesting things that happened then. Um, there was an argument that the three-year automatic indexing violated the notice and comment rule. And we're going to come back to that a little bit, little bit later. But if every three years the number goes up, the argument was you have to go through this very notice of rulemaking that we're engaged in right now a preliminary rule, a comment period, reconsideration, and a final rule. And if you don't, then you can't automatically increase the numbers every three years. Because the judge otherwise invalidated and enjoined the rule preliminarily, he never reached that automatic indexing um, argument. So uh, it, the other key point I think that's important is that Judge uh, Mazant said that this whole business with the salary level isn't even in the statute. Remember, go back to the original slide I showed you where we talked about the origin, origins of the FLSA. Nowhere does it mention salary. And it was only when Libby was talking about the Secretary of Labor's regulatory power and authority that they came up with a salary at all the judge in Texas was thinking, why are we even here? So think about that issue as we talk later about that challenge in 2016. Ultimately, the court granted a permanent injunction in August of 2017. The Department of Labor, who was being sued, appealed to the Fifth Circuit. And the Fifth Circuit, with the agreement of all parties, stayed the case pending further rulemaking. And if you'll recall, in 2017, there was a change in the White House. And so we had a new Department of Labor, new leadership. There was a renewed effort to take a fresh look at the rule. So essentially, the 2016 rule was tabled. Despite all the work that everyone put in, and all the hand-wringing about what to do that day before December 1st, it was tabled. So as Libby sort of alluded to, some companies had already decided to make changes and increase salaries. Some companies had decided we're going to unwind those increases. So the guy that we just gave a raise to, we're going to unraise him. Uh, positions that had gone from exempt to non-exempt went back to exempt. Some people stayed at exempt but it was a really tumultuous time. So through 2017 and 2018, the Department of Labor worked on new rulemaking. And in uh, March of 2019, we saw a new 
final rule. And this rule essentially said that instead of the really big 913 a week number, we're going to have a lower number. Let's call it a compromise. And given that we are in the middle of a Republican administration, this sort of seemed to work for everyone. So we, w we would be going from 455 to 684. We would include in this 684 this 10% trigger. You see the second bullet point. We were all, I think, introduced to this trigger in 2019, wondering how it worked. Basically, 10% of the minimum salary level could be satisfied with something else, some non-discretionary bonus or commission that is paid annually or more frequently, sort of a 10% true up. I will tell you now, three or four years in, I'm sure Libby will agree, we rarely, rarely see companies utilizing this 10% trigger. Seems to me like right. it was an experiment that never quite worked. Um, it was a concession, I think, to the business community that was never really utilized by the business community. But so that was offered as part of the 2019 final rule. And the highly compensated exemption or exception, um, the total annual compensation requirement went from 100 to 107 instead of $134,000. So that was a really big concession um, that was given to the business community by the Department of Labor. And importantly, there was no indexing over years um, following this rule. And this rule took effect in 2019. So we've all lived under this 684 rule for now three and a half years. Um, and uh, we have heard now for over a year that these proposed rules that uh, uh, Libby's going to talk about, we've been bearing for the last half hour, um, would be coming <laughs> out. Um, we heard about it a year ago. And I want to say in every month for the last year, the Department of Labor was convinced they were coming. Um, but as you can imagine, we're going to talk about a little bit more. The timing is almost too late for the Department of Labor. And we'll talk about that in a second. But I think we're finally ready to talk about like the main event, Libby. Like, what is the current proposed rule? Yeah, so let's we'll get into that and what we're what we're all here to talk about and what what has been proposed. And I just want to just a few points as to where we are right now. Um, and to David's point, yes, I know we've just now spent thirty minutes setting the stage as to how we got here, but I do think it's important because. Um, there are a lot of considerations as to uh, even what the underpinnings are for the salary level, which is really all that is being proposed to change here. And the challenges that occurred in, in 2016, which caused an enormous amount, which I'm uh, enormous amount of, of work and consideration and upheaval in some, in some cases to a lot of employers in having to rethink how their current workforce was being paid, even if it was just determining that certain groups of employees should be reclassified and at what level and there's, there's a, as, as I'm sure many people on this call can appreciate, there's a lot that goes on behind that. You have to reprogram your, um, your payroll systems. You have to test that. You have to give notifications to employees. You have to update policies. Uh, you have to make those determinations as to what, what employees are going to be impacted, and if there's other compensation, such as bonuses or other incentives that will come into play. And so 
what happened in 2019 was, as David mentioned, truly a compromise between the Department of Labor working with the regulated business community to figure out what they could live with. And then we have coming in the current notice of proposed rulemaking, which is really revisiting that 2016 rulemaking, which is kind of what set us up for a lot of this tumultuous uh, back and forth as to do we need to make changes? And if we make changes, are they too late to unwind? Because in many circumstances, many of my clients um, made all of the changes that were required in 2016 to implement that final rule because it was going into effect. It was going into effect on December 1st. Um, and even though there were legal challenges out there, there was no certainty at all that those legal challenges would be successful or in what form or in what timeline. And so many employers did take significant steps, as I mentioned, many of the things that I just kind of had listed, to update compliance. And once you've updated that, a lot of those are very hard to unwind. And so right now, we are faced with a very similar proposal as to what we, we saw with the Obama administration. Um, and I, I haven't done a, a comparison. I keep saying I, I should. I should kind of do like a, a track comparison of the two proposals because in some ways they feel as though they are so similar that the numbers have just been changed. So instead of tying it or, or keying it on the 40th percentile, which is what the, the 2016 rule did, it's now keyed to the 35th percentile, for example. So looking at actually what the proposal says and what we're looking at um, the proposed changes to mean, at base, it's increasing the salary level, the current salary level, which is set at the 684 a week or a little over 35,000 a year to tie it to the 35, the 35th percentile in that lowest census region, which is currently set in the South. And here's where the Department of Labor really buries the lead. And they, they truly do bury it. They bury it in a footnote because the number that was reported um, as the headline in a lot of the, the publications it talks about a $55,000 annualized amount, or so a little over $1,000 per week. But if you dig into what the Department of Labor is really proposing, is that they are going to look at what the data says at the time they issue the final rule. Now, just to, context, to con contextualize this a bit and give you a bit of a timeline, the last regulatory process, um, the proposed rule was issued in July of 2015, and the final rule was issued almost a year later, at the end of May of 2016. And so, right Right now, um, I don't know if they have that much time if they want to have the rule finalized and in place prior to the inauguration, prior to the completion of the election cycle and the inauguration. Um, so I think they're going to have to condense that time frame a little bit. But in the proposed rulemaking, they do estimate that as of the first quarter of 2014, the salary threshold could be as high as $1,158 per week or over $60,000 annualized. And if you're pushing this out even into quarter two, which is likely when we're going to see a final rule actually completed and, and issued, it's going to be even higher than that um, by a bit. So we're looking at probably over $60,000 pursuant to the metrics that they put into place in, in their current rulemaking. 
They've also then taken that highly compensated employee exemption or exception that we've talked about. And instead of tying it to the 90th percentile, as they did in 2016, they have taken a concession and they have lowered that to the 85th percentile. Now that takes you to based on and for some, they they use um, 2022 data because it's that's the last complete data set they have, but presuming that they would then substitute that with 2023 data once the final rule is in, so this number is likely to be higher at the time of implementation. But that takes you to almost 144 thousand um, dollars, and then they also propose those automatic increases at those same levels, that 35th and 85th percentile level, every three years. Now, one thing that they do not put in to the proposed regulations, which they had teased for the past year or so as they had been talking about the issuance of these, of these proposed regulations, were changes to the duties test. So it is something that, that, were, that was on our radar that we thought Perhaps there would be some changes um, that would be proposed to the duties test, but now it, it solely relates, again, very similarly to the 2015-2016 the rulemaking and final rule just to salary. Um, a few other changes just for your information that were put into place in the proposed regulations involve the um, the U.S. territories. Um, currently, the U.S. territories were not impacted by the the 2019 final final rule, nor were they implemented or impacted by the 2016 final rule. Um, they've always been subject to a different salary threshold, and so they were actually set at the 4.55 per week. Um, but here it's been proposed that they will be subject to the same increase, the same and the same automatic increases as the rest of um, of the U.S. states, and that the only special salary that would be designated and set out would be for the American Samoa, and that it would be set at the 84th percent of the general salary level. And so, which is, it's already set at a lower level. And so it would be set at that 84th percentile. And then there's also a, a, an increase because there's a special carve out exemption for certain individuals that work in the motion picture producing industry. So there's just like a very special carve out that would increase the salary for those individuals. Um, David, what what are you what are we thinking? I know I've just talked a little bit about the time frame, but what are you what are we thinking? The time frame is looking like. Um, well, do you have any estimates, estimates, or any uh, predictions as to what, what we're are the two? At? Not tomorrow. Um, all right, so let's <laughs> sort of break oh, down the. Break down the process. So we are currently in this notice of proposed rulemaking. So we've seen the proposals. And there is a comment period that's now open. It's a 60-day comment period that's set by statute. Every rule has to undergo, every regulatory rule has to undergo this notice and comment period. And we'll talk a little bit about more, a bit more about comments in a minute. But Everybody, um, employees, companies, trade associations, uh, uh, can prepare comments, and that stays open uh, currently through November 7th of this year. Uh, there's already been an extension filed. Uh, there will be more extensions filed. I'm sorry, extension requests filed. There will be more requests filed. And it would not be unusual, we think, for maybe another 15 days to get granted or 30 days. But the timeline is extremely tight because all of the comments have to be reviewed. And these aren't like 100 comments. They are tens of thousands of comments that come in. And they have to be distilled down. 
and reviewed. And you can imagine a stack of administrators going through 100,000 comments, trying to figure out the most important points of each and how to organize that. Because they, they then take those most salient points in those comments and they drop those into they make they make decisions about what the final rule should say and then they include them in another 100 to 200 page final rule and you can imagine that can take two months three months six months um and so we expect there to be thousands and thousands of comments here so it could be it could be well into um, the uh, the the middle of the year of 2024 before we see a final rule. Um, it could be even as late as the summer when we see a final rule. The final rule will tell us what 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 we need to do with regards to salary level. It could be slightly different than what we see now based on all the comments. Um, and then they typically give 120 to 180 days to implement. Now, keep in mind, there's a presidential cycle election coming up. The Department of Labor desperately wants to get this rule effective before inauguration. So if Biden loses the White House, the Republicans claim the White House, there will be a new Department of Labor that rolls in. And if the rule is not effective by the time that Republican administration rolls in, it could essentially be tabled. All these months and months and months of work get tabled. So they are going to do their best to turn around the comments into a final rule um, and have an effective date that likely precedes um, that inauguration date. Probably something like December 1, exactly like what happened in the Obama-Trump administration transition in 2016. Um, so maybe late fall, early winter, we'll see an effective date. In terms of planning internally, I would plan a final rule um, that's effective sometime late next year. And so, but what about the challenges? Because Littler and others represented companies that and states that challenged this. Are we going to do that again? Almost certainly, there will be dozens of challengers um, that synthesize probably in a few courtrooms to challenge these rules again. And some of the arguments uh, will be the same. Uh, there will be a few, I think, unique arguments. Um, I think one of the most interesting arguments is that uh, the Senate never confirmed a Secretary of Labor. And so there will be an argument that the Secretary of Labor must have been confirmed before they can promulgate regulations. Because uh, we only have an acting secretary at the Department of Labor and not a and not a confirmed secretary, um, that will be a basis for challenging whether these regulations can be promulgated at all. There's also this issue I brought up a minute ago where we talked about uh, the North Texas judge who said, there ain't nothing in the FLSA that talks about salary levels. That theme came up again in a lawsuit called Faludi versus U.S. Shale, in an oral argument uh, raised by Justice Ho in the Fifth Circuit. And then it came up again during oral argument at the Supreme Court versus in Hewitt versus Helix. It was a day rate case. I was there in the Supreme Court that day when Justice Kavanaugh said, what is all this business with salary levels in this case anyway, there's no basis in the statute for salary levels. And then we saw the opinion, the written opinion in Hewitt versus Helix later this year, where the judge 
said in his dissent, Justice Kavanaugh said it in his dissent. This is maybe the most important words uh, of the year. It is questionable whether the department's regulations, which look not only at an employee's duties, but also how much an employee is paid and how an employee is paid, will survive if and when the regulations are challenged as inconsistent with the Fair Labor Standards Act. So I think almost certainly we're going to see challenges there. We're going to see challenges that the salary level subverts the duties test, just like the challenge in 2016. And we will also see a challenge that the automatic increase of the salary level every year, every three years, here it's every three years, um, um, necessarily takes away the notice and comment rulemaking requirements and therefore is inconsistent with federal law. So I think stay tuned for that. You'll hear a lot more about litigation. Uh, and maybe there's a little bit of a uh, boy who cried wolf here, Libby. I'm worried people are like, oh, we've been, we played this game before. We're not going to do anything. We're just going to wait to see what happens next. What do you think about that, Libby? I know. I, I still, you know, <laughs> I mean, that's the, those are the discussions we've been having is while this very similar, somewhat similar, rule regulation was challenged and enjoined and ultimately revised and reissued at a much lower level a few years ago. So why should I hurry up and make any changes right now? I, I mean, it's a val it's, it is a valid consideration, but litigation, there's no certainties with litigation. And there's no certainties with the timing of litigation either, much less the outcome. And so there are several steps that you should be or could be taking right now in anticipation or preparation. Um, of course, we don't know specifically what the final rule is going to look like. So we don't know what those final numbers are going to be. But just even looking to see what your current workforce is right now i think what that looks like i think is is really advisable and from a regulatory perspective um participating in that regulatory process especially if this is something that is of concern to you if you did go through the 2016 process you've already made changes and it, and it impacted you and you don't want to have to do this again. Or if you're looking at your your current workforce and, and this is going to have a significant effect um, and you do have concerns, this is something that you can submit those comments to your senators, to your representatives, directly to the Department of Labor. They are they have to they they have to read everything and they do read everything um you can go through not only individually and submit those comments or you could do it in conjunction with your trade associations or you could reach out to attorneys i know littler through our workplace institute uh, initiatives, we have coalitions that we are developing and that we have that are submitting comments, and Littler itself is also submitting comments. So there are a lot of different avenues to get your voice heard if you do have concerns. Um, and then, as I was mentioning, you don't have Libby, to wait for the final rule. Yeah, go ahead. Libby, I was just going to say, one thing that people may not realize is that the unions will mobilize their workforce. And they will write 10 comments for every one employer that writes a comment. So to some extent, it's really important that employers get out there and write comments. Even if they're not going to work with a coalition, they just get with their lawyers or just darn it, write their own letter and submit it themselves. Wouldn't you agree, Libby? Oh, I absolutely agree. I think it's very important. It's really easy to do. You can submit it directly online. Um, there's a way it, you may just do it all electronically and you can do it in let you do it in letter form. Um, and I would also, you know, say start, you can start reviewing the exempt status and look at the sal what the salary increase would do 
if it's going to be increased to 60,000, you know, the people that are being paid right now 35 to 60, what does that look like if, if you would have to increase to 60 for your workforce? And then if you have a large population that you are at least in part relying on the highly compensated employee exemption, it might be a good opportunity both to take a look at the compensation as well as the basis for that, um, both from kind of a duties perspective as well as the compensation perspective and just take a more holistic look at what you want to do with that population, as well as the entire population of your employees. And then you can assess whether to increase those salary or, or reclassify. Um, that, that decision for reclassification, particularly on salary, you know, there's a, a couple of different things that you can take into consideration. You can look at doing the reclassification if that's something that you want to start budgeting for or deciding, all right, does it make sense to do an increase or is there a way that we could reclassify in more of a cost neutral basis? And there's a way to do that. We've included some formulas here. It, it, start taking a look at how much overtime people are working. Um, because if we're going to want to reclassify people, we're probably going to want to take into consideration what those overtime costs are. And if so, what the um, what the formula is for reclassifying in terms of salary. Like, do we want to bake in, not bake in, but do we want to include potential overtime when we're making the, the hourly rates? Or do we want to just understand and try to manage overtime for those people that, that we might have to reclassify? And again, I think just generally, and we saw this a lot in 2015 going into 2016, it's an opportunity just to take a look generally at your workforce um, and what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, if there's other if there's other ways that you you could look at their duties and if they should be classified as exempt, not just based on salary, but based on their duties. Um, yeah, I would say. And I know I would yeah, please. Yeah, I was just going to say there, I think it's a great opportunity since you have the attention of your business leaders to look at sort of other positions at issue and to maybe clean out the closet a little bit. I think that, um, you know, the agencies and the employees and everyone are going to expect changes anyway. So maybe it's a good chance. It's a good opportunity to sort of take a fresh look at everything in your system. Yeah, absolutely. And I know... Um, and I can let Michael speak to this a little bit. I mean, we partnered, we partner on an ongoing basis with Compliance HR, but I know Compliance HR was was utilized in a significant fashion during the time frame of both 2015-2016, as well as the final rule that went into place in 2019. Um, for a lot of employers who are looking at whether or not their classification decisions were appropriate and could be supported, both in looking at the compensation basis, but then using compliance HR to also test the duties basis and to see if there were any pressure points there. And so I don't know, Michael, if you wanted to talk a little bit more about yeah. just the Yeah, I would love HR. to. Um, let me in Libby and David, thank you for breaking down, um, you know, what, what's ahead. Um, but quite honest, you know, compliance is like personal hygiene. You know, you just don't do it. You know, you don't brush your teeth before you go to the dentist. It's a way of life. And making sure your positions are accurate and up to date is something that you can do on a regular basis. What's great about today's proposed changes are that you've got time to look at things. You're not going to be up against the wall with a, a strict deadline like people had before. It's a great opportunity to use a tool like Navigator Overtime. You put your fact pattern in, not only does it give you the risk, it gives you a transcript of how it was answered, and it also breaks down your most riskiest positions, and it tells you what the risk is, it applies your fact, to, fact pattern to it, so it helps you identify what's going on. When the, 20, uh, when the rules were changed in 2020, we updated our system within 
five days to have the new um, salary threshold put in there. So folks could come in, rerun their fact pattern through our system, and get a fresh perspective on how the new rules um, came into effect. I'm not sure if we put up a polling um, questionnaire or not, but um, we were going to put one up. And if you are still interested in uh, meeting with us for a brief demo and free trial, we can show you how these tools were used to identify people's riskiest positions and then spend your your time and your money trying to get those resolved and fit in with what the proposed changes are. So it's a great time to be able to get ahead of these things and not wait till the last minute. But you know, it's only had to do 10 or 20 or 50 positions in a month or a quarter. It's a lot better than waiting to the last minute. We are at the uh, the top of the hour. Um, again, um, people can still register um, by clicking yes, click our free trial. Thank you all so very much for your time today. Libby, David, thank you for your insight into what's coming forward. And please reach out to us. We would love to work with you and help you figure out where your biggest challenges are and, and get your house in order. So thank you again. And everyone, please enjoy the rest of your day.